Marsha, I'm one of the graduates of Royal Road University's Human Security and Peace Building Program, a learner, as Paz always referred to us. I wanted to share with you some treasured memories, some ideas, and some just some tidbits that I have with me at this moment that I wanted to share with you. I cannot be there with you uh, physically today. But I was really happy to have this opportunity. Uh, I want to talk about Paris, who brought uh, incredible dynamism and charisma and a uh, hope-filled energy to our learning challenges. She created this kind of space, you know, for each student to gain access to what was inside of each one of us, to find out what our own unique gift would be in in the in the project, then once once we began to find that gift, she was there to steward us in weaving this magic that she had for networking. She linked us to a world of individuals, certainly of the most uh, incredible kind of people she brought together for us to have benefit of and to hear and to learn from. But she also linked us to a world of which she had a unique vision about. Her world was a world of hope and of potential and of great compassion. We all wrestled with what it all meant, the big and the small, and how we could fit into it and how we could all do something. But that was the kind of space we were learning in, a never easy, but one that was uh, fully charged with uh, love, I must say that. Paz would be also uh, pleased to know that I'm continuing to work with the Pearson Peacekeeping Center and I'm off to Turkey to help uh, be part of the team that trains the Turkish Army in civil military cooperation. I'm continuing to learn every day. Never know what's around my next corner, but that's what I'm up to these days. So I'll, I'm so happy I had a chance to be there with you today. I'm going on now to uh, a Ph.D. in leadership and change. I owe some of that possibility to my work with Paz Goodadol, who helped me see that I could uh, do, do the thing that uh, I thought I could do. Bless you all, and I hope to see you soon. If anyone uh, would like to be in touch, that would be wonderful. Please do that and contact me at Marsha Lake 2003 at yahoo.ca. I'd love to hear from you.
This is a tribute to Dr. Paz Budadal and heartfelt and with much love. It's titled Powerful, Passionate, Peaceful Paz, a tribute to a woman of extraordinary vision and love. For over 25 years, with secrets whispered long into the wee hours of the morning about surviving and making a difference in a man's world, Dr. Paz Budadal has been my valued colleague and friend. From our initial involvement on the boards of the Canadian Association for Adult Education and the Canadian Association for the Study of Adult Education, to our time in Ottawa as public servant, Paz with the International Development Research Centre, to our mutual interest in ethical futures and peace, and to our most recent time as professors and university administrators here in British Columbia. Dr. Budadal generously shared her compassion, independence, knowledge, and experience. She didn't need her connection with the great adult educator, Paolo Freire, to make her a superstar in my mind. She had those qualities on her own. With my blonde hair turning very white and her auburn hair defining her, defying her years, Paz and I, with our respective spouses and our mutual friends, continued our practice of sharing many fine bottles of wine, delicious dinners, and even more delicious conversations. To me, Dr. Paz Budadal represented all of the very best in a highly competent, compassionate, and intellectual woman. She will be greatly missed. While my husband and I share in the sadness of her family and friends, we also celebrate a life well lived. Here's to you, Dr. Budadal. To live in the hearts of those we leave behind is not to die. And this is from Dr. Lynn Burton and Mario Piamonte. And for any of your friends that I've lost touch with, I can be reached at leburton at sfu.ca. I wish I could be with you with lots of love, Lynn. Thank you for being here at the celebration of life for Dr. Paz Budadal. I had the privilege of of uh, speaking with Paz uh, at the hospice on Wednesday night, uh, October 3rd. I got there around 8.30 at night and uh, stayed until nearly 10 o'clock. She was uh, tired and in extreme pain, but she wanted to talk and share ideas on our, on our research collaboration initiative about the learners, about her programs, and generally offering advice on a number of issues. She was encouraging me to do, encouraging me as well as challenging me to do the right things for Royal Oak University. She had an unquavering commitment to her students, the learners, and the human security and peace building program, and continued to give me her ideas about what could and should be done to make the program better. Having been most recently involved in the online course for the Masters of Arts in Disaster and Emergency Management, she offered her advice as to what was required to make it a better program as well. She was always thinking of others, her students, the program, her colleagues, Royal Roads, her family, but not herself. I've only had the privilege of knowing Paz for the past six months, but she immediately impressed me with her commitment and determination to make things better and address the wrongs that have been committed. And she certainly had her opinions on, on what they were and what I was supposed to do about them. We <laughs> always knew where she stood. Soon after I arrived, I attended a Confederation of University Faculty Association meeting in Vancouver where Paz received an award. At the end of the night, she was tired, yet made arrangements for me to ride with her to the airport so we could talk and get to know each other a little better. Maybe she just wanted to help me with my Spanish. We shared a love and a passion for her country of birth, Chile. And I think that made us allies, no matter what our positions were. The first time she came to my office, she noted the bronze commemorative plaques of four Chilean revolutionaries. Violeta Parra, Victor Jara, Salvador Allende, and Pablo Neruda. It is Pablo Neruda that defines so clearly the role that Paz played in her life in Del Canto General, the general song. 
quiero que la salida de fábricas y minas esté mi poesía ha pedido a la izquierda, al aire y la victoria del hombre maltratado. Eso es bastante. Esa es la corona que quiero. What I want when you leave your factories and your mines is that my poetry is adhered to on earth and the earth, to the victory of man mistreated. That is enough. That is the crown that I want. Paz was committed to confronting injustice and especially redressing the wrongs suffered by the victims of mistreatment. Bishop Desmond Tutu expressed it in this way, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. <laughs> Those who care about or care for past and cherish her memory must not be neutral to injustice. They must continue to fight, to learn, and to learn to make a difference. When we do, we honor her legacy. And when we forget, we simply need to remind ourselves of what Paz would do. What advice would she give us? Robert F. Kennedy observed, it is for the numberless, diverse, diverse acts of courage and beliefs that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. I would observe that a woman such as Dr. Paz, stand, when she stands up, a huge wave of hope is unleashed. The university has lost a good friend and champion of scholarship and community. Her colleagues and students from all over the world know her as someone who believed fiercely in the value and gift of learning. As someone who abided by the wise counsel of being true to oneself, living in the present, and working generously on behalf of learning and others. Royal Roach University owes Dr. Paz Budadol, its deep gratitude and appreciation for the exemplary service and commitment she has made to its development and to its ideals. In closing, some words of advice from another teacher of Paz, Mahatma Gandhi. Liz, live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. Let's not grieve too long. Paz was determined to make a difference. Let us pick up her yoke. She would do it for us in a minute. Thank you. Met them, the children were about this high, so I've seen them through a lot of uh, important events. This program today is wide open. It's like Paz's adult education program planning. Um, open and a bit uncertain, but kind of exciting. The, these children, John and Maria, have now lost both their parents. And it doesn't matter, even if you're an adult, to lose your parents is a hard thing to live with. So although we're here to celebrate Paz's life, we're also here to give them memories that they can take through the rest of their life. There are only two set speakers, and they're from the family. That's John Park, Paz's husband, and then Maria Butadol. After that, it's up to us. So, without any further ado, John Park. Good afternoon. Welcome, all of you, to this lovely celebration for past. <coughs> Friends, relatives, colleagues, and students. <coughs> to share in this wonderful celebration. And certainly it's gratifying to be in the presence of so much goodwill and love. I have so many memories of past, and though we were only married a uh, short six years, she loved to introduce herself, as someone has said, with the words, I'm Paz Butadol. Paz is a Spanish word for peace. I think her whole life was about peace. Whether she was connecting people, connecting with people, righting wrongs, teaching, or dealing with students, she was seeking solutions that led to peace. She spoke to me at one point of her desire to become a healer. I think she was. 
and is carrying on the same today. Of course, I didn't know too much about her when we first met, but gradually I came to realize what a remarkable person she was, and is, and what a remarkable life she had, and to have accomplished all she did, and yet I think I've only discovered the tip of an iceberg in this respect. Did you know that she was a nun? Did you know that she was a television producer working with young people? Did you know that she was a film reviewer sitting on film juries in Europe? Did you know that she had a private audience with Pope Paul VI? Did you know that she obtained her three university degrees, including a doctorate, within the space of about five years? And that while raising two young children, working and learning English. I came rather late to the scene in 2001. We met on the internet. Kaz was always interested in technology and <laughs> About two years before, she had lost her dear husband, Knut Gudadal, with whom she had ha was happily married for about 26 years. She regarded him as a saint. So I didn't know how I was going to live up to that. <laughs> Our courtship was a whirlwind affair, but everything worked out in such a wonderful way that I knew that each of us had made the right choices. Besides which, Paz had it all planned. <laughs> no doubt with contingency measures as well. <laughs> She was in Vancouver and I was in Ottawa. How to get together? All of a sudden, she had four contracts to work in Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> and as she tells me, she hadn't even angled for these contracts. <laughs> and this within a few weeks of our meeting. When she, finished vis when she finished visiting me in Ottawa, she invited me back to Vancouver for six weeks and then whisked me down to Chile on a whirlwind team teaching assignment she had with a colleague of hers from UBC. There I met her relatives, who we found out later wouldn't be able to come to the wedding, so that was, that was a plus. And there I proposed to her. The wedding took place the same year in the Anglican Cathedral in downtown Vancouver, where she was a member. And that was Thanksgiving Day weekend, about six years ago. It turned out to be a joyous interaction with her friends and her wonderful family. What attracted her to me, I have never quite figured out. We were such opposites in terms of personality and character. And she always says that I lived in another world. I'm actually a spiritual healer. Perhaps I do act as if I'm not always here. Yet we had a special love for one another that bridged our two worlds. Perhaps she was attracted to my peace and the way I dealt with life and its problems. In any case, she would often come to me and say, pray, 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 <laughs> when she was dealing with some financial problem or with some difficulty with a student or with the university or whatever. And she expected results. <laughs> <laughs> Most things would work out in a very interesting and unexpected way. Although she didn't necessarily voice it, she was very spiritually, a very spiritually minded person. She was certainly very discerning of character. I think I was, it was partly this spirituality about her nature that attracted me. As well, she was a good listener. And she always knew what she was doing. And what she did, she did well. Besides which, she was always thoughtful, loving, and generous to a fault. And she was always thinking, I shouldn't say to a fault, that was one of her wonderful characteristics. And she was always thinking. She said that she could never turn her ticker off. Often she couldn't sleep and would be up in the middle of the night at three or four in the morning, working away at her computer. 
Hoa Chua invites Skype to students in Thailand, Serbia, or Iraq, or somewhere else in the world. I think that need to be on her computer was in part a need to be in touch with people. But she especially loved to help people around her. She loved people. And I think she especially loved the good she could see in others. So I think that's what made her good at getting people together at keeping in touch and at doing all those special things that make for good relationships. And she was good at seeing through problems that others felt were impossible to solve. She could see things that others had missed. Nothing was impossible for Paz. And although we all love her each in our own way, yet her life went far beyond beyond any single person or group. Her life will continue to bless many through the influence she's had on her students, colleagues, and friends. You know, there are as many paths in this room as there are people. Each of us has a unique view of her that is part of the rich tapestry of our lives. And no thread or design of this tapestry can ever be lost, for it's part of an idea existing in the universe of ideas. True, we seem to lose the physical presence of someone, and certainly we can lose people if we look too earnestly for their presence in the flesh. I believe that as we grow in our understanding of the nature of reality, either here or hereafter, we'll recover what we thought we lost, and then make it our own. Those who embrace the ideals and qualities of, that Paz express, and for me is still expressing, truly make Paz their own and cannot lose her. She's an indispensable part of all of us and the universe. Till we meet again, dearest Paz, dearest sweetie. So what I'd like to do is take some time to read some of the messages that they sent for us. I'll start with her brother Valerio, who's in Chile right now. And he says, when embarking on the train of life, she made her trip full of challenges, dreams, hopes, and goodbyes. With all the people with whom she shared her seat, she looked for the best in each and contributed so that their respective luggage group became valuable and enriched. Her trip on this train stood her, as a, stood her out as a person who enjoyed every single moment of life. And she was a generous woman, a person with strong tenacity to fulfill her objectives and goals. All these aspects made her an outstanding professional, made it worth her while to achieve the goals that she proposed for herself. And now, when disembarking on the main station, her empty seat leaves us with nostalgia and beautiful memories for all of us who still remain on this trip. Let us offer up a prayer so that God welcomes her in his kingdom. That's from Valerio Correa in, uh, in Santiago, Chile. She also um, had a younger sister who now lives in Bergen, in Norway. And Sophia says, my dear sister Paz, what else can be added to what has already been expressed in the obituary, except that you fully incarnated your name, Peace. I believe our names express our potential, and a full life can be measured by the extent in which we act upon our given names, and you have. Thank you so much for your contribution to the world. I'm happy and honored to have been your younger sister in this life. With all my love, Sophia Bordelet. It was also, I also had the uh, privilege of meeting a good friend of mom's, Lucia Carvajal. Um, they met when they were very young, in 1965, um, in, in cinema courses, actually, at the um, Universidad Católica in Chile. And she wrote a really lovely piece, and I'm going to read just a little bit of it. Um, when she was writing this, Piece from um, she recalled a poem from Pablo Neruda and she um, wrote down a little moment, a little piece of it. It says, Muere lentamente que no viaja, que no lee, que no oye música, que no encuentra gracia en sí mismo. And I won't translate it, but I'll just leave it with you. Um, just a love the words. And she goes on to talk about their moments when they worked together and um, how uh, her trip to Canada, for her embodied the the expression attributed to Julius Caesar 
um, which you might know in the Latin, Vene Vidi Vici, or Vene Vidi Vici, depending on your pronunciation. And in Spanish, Vine Vi Vivenci. And she did indeed conquer everything she tried. Um, and I'd like to leave off Lucia's message by saying that she said, Lamento profundamente, Pasita, no poder acompañar, acompañarte en esta tan merecida celebración por la vida. Pero quise decirte gracias por el privilegio de ser tu amiga. She says, thank you for the privilege of having been your friend. And this is from her family, her, her, uh, her husband Willie, her, her son and daughter Bernadita, Pablo, and Maria Jose. And uh, she wishes us all um, her, her regards. And for myself, I'd just like to say, I'm not very good at extemporaneous speaking, but I'd just like to mention that of all the lessons that mom's taught me, That one of the things that I've always encountered whenever I've been faced with a profound challenge, a life changing moment, something about a job that I thought I wanted but I wasn't sure whether I should apply for it, whether I had the credentials for it, and her voice in my head would say, Why not? Just go for it. And, and that's something that I'll always carry with me is her fearlessness and um, ability to get past those moments in life when you think you might not be able to make it, but she could. And that's what I take with me. Thank you. My name is Barbara Owens, and Paz and I have been friends for more than 25 years, and we've traveled <coughs> many roads together. We first met in the early 1980s. Um, I was a grad student at UBC, and Paz had just come on board uh, as faculty. She was co-managing a, a program design and development project, and I was one of the research assistants in that project. And at the first meeting, on the project team, things started to go very, very badly. The senior project manager began by trying to tell us how we would proceed, what we would do, how we would start collecting all of the content for this particular project. Kept going around and around in circles, and I thought, what have I gotten myself in for? Has sat very quietly for a long time. <coughs> And then when she did speak up and when she did interject, it was memorable. <laughs> I'm the instructional design expert here, she said, and we will do things the right way. <laughs> we will not begin by bringing up content. We will begin by defining objectives. And at that moment, I thought to myself, boy, I like this woman. One of my favorite memories of Paz, and it's something that John has mentioned, was the way in which she introduced herself to many of the new classes of students. Uh, and she would usually begin by saying, I used to be a nun, as John has already mentioned. And of course, this would engender all sorts of interest and all sorts of curiosity. Now, it's true that Paz did receive her early training, her early education uh, at a convent, had her first teacher training there, her initial teacher training there. It was never really quite clear. She never really told us how come she left the convent before she took her vows. But many of us suspect that she probably was fomenting insurrection among the other students there. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the reason, the habits and some of the approaches to life and to work that Paz had certainly came from that source. And I remember being struck by two things in particular. One of them was the discipline of her daily routine, and the second was her ability to focus intensely to concentrate on the task at hand. In the early years of our friendship, uh, I was introduced to both of those. Now in those days, Paz and I traveled and worked a lot together. Never did two people with such different and mismatched fire rhythms have to share a hotel room. <laughs> I come from a family of night owls, late to bed, late to rise. Paz, on the other hand, well, Paz was a nun. <laughs> so no matter what time our heads hit the pillow at night, you can be sure that at 5 a.m., on would come the lights, in would come the room service breakfast, we were off for the day. And often, as I was still struggling to get my eyes to focus, she'd be on the phone with a colleague half a world away, planning, wide awake, brain and gear working immediately. That kind of 
discipline carried on throughout her entire life and perhaps explains to some small extent why she was able to accomplish so much. The second thing, of course, was her ability to focus. And when Pat sat down to work, it was with an intensity and concentration that was almost palpable. She would sit at the computer and she would whip off her research proposal or a report and make it seem effortless. And now clearly she already had composed it in her head because typically her first draft would be like the fourth or fifth draft for most of the rest of us. And to top it off, she was generally working on several proposals or several reports at any given time. So when we talk about multitasking, that's way too mild a word to describe what Paz used to do. So spending time with Paz in those early days, I learned two very useful things, flexibility, and focus. Extreme flexibility. <laughs> Extreme focus. I don't know if we can credit the convent for this one, but Paz's energy and her stamina were legendary. She could get off a plane, and I've been with her in these times, after spending 25 or 30 hours traveling in airports and, and in airplanes without a stop, and she could go straight to a crucial meeting, and she would be totally in control and on track. Paz, as you know, was not a nine to five person either. Outcomes were what counted. And we burned a great deal of midnight oil together as we finished up all sorts of projects. I always imagined, especially when I first knew her, that she had some kind of secret weapon, like a cylinder of compressed energy or compressed oxygen or something <laughs> tucked away in her jacket somewhere. And whatever the source, any time her energy flags even the slightest bit, somehow she recharged and the whirlwind was off and running again. Paz, as many of you know, was one of the most creative people one could ever hope to meet. I often used to tease her that she probably had more ideas in five minutes than most of us do in a month, or maybe a year. Now, um, it took, I, I still learned in those early days as well that there were different categories of ideas as well. Some were tossed about just for fun, uh, some might possibly take shape, and then there were those that definitely had to be accomplished. Of the less serious variety, it took me some time at first to figure out why Paz was so energized by playing with these ideas. And I probably was a real spoiled sport at first until I caught on. I said, yes, Paz, those are great Air Force airfares to Thailand, but they're a limited time, and I don't think we can go next week. Or one of my other favorites that we used to talk about, yes, Paz, that's a fascinating article about retiring in Mexico, but no, Paz, I don't think I'll put the house on the market just yet. <laughs> but as I got to know her better, and I gained more insights into what made her tick, and I finally caught on, I finally realized it was the sheer exhilaration of running with a new idea, the delight of an unfettered imagination, no censors, no critics, and the absolute joy of plotting with friends and of laughing hysterically at our own absurdity. Of course, there were also the other category of ideas, the ones that Paz was determined to bring to fruition. To make these a reality, she worked it tirelessly, calculated all the angles, gathered in resources, and never gave up. We probably all heard her trademark phrase, I never take no for an answer, which was born out of that extraordinary determination and tenacity. Of course, it also spoke to her ability to rethink and reframe her plan when she thought she came up against some kind of a dead end. It spoke to her creativity and her open-mindedness as she considered different approaches, to her willingness to listen to trusted advisors, and to her intellectual nimbleness. We have all probably seen or been part of such experiences. Paz may have been a thinker, a conceptualizer, but that did not mean she lived life in the abstract. She was also a doer and lived very much in the present with enthusiasm and amazing zest for life. She was interested in everything and everybody, always had an opinion, and had an amazing 
insight into practically everything. Paz delighted in the outrages, was full of contradictions, was brilliant, compassionate, generous to the nth degree. She had a sharp wit and contagious sense of humor. She was steadfast and loyal to all her friends. In other words, she was magnificent. In many ways, she was larger than life. And those of us who knew her well, loved her dearly, exactly as she was. I'll never forget her, and consider myself very blessed to have had her in my life for so many years. I hope I'm clear in my comments. Uh, please forgive me for reading for the prepared notes. I couldn't possibly say what I want to say today in the time available unless I read them, and, uh, and there's much more to be said. Um, I started my master's degree at UBC in 1995 when Paz was still around campus. I knew her then only as a name on the door and as a fleeting image as she purposely strode down the well-worn hallways at UBC. I wish I had known her then, but fate dictated that I would not come to know her in the relatively sedate light as a student. But later on, I came to know her and work with her in the crucible of conflict. It was the summer of 2005. I was vacationing when I received a call on my cell phone, the first of many. <laughs> she was calling me in her capacity then as the Vice President of the Royal Roads University Faculty Association. I knew who she was. I remembered her from, from the times I saw her at UBC. But I was surprised she knew who I was because I wasn't in her area. I never took any classes with her. I, uh, I don't think I even you know, palled around with any of the students that she had had, or people had worked with her. Um, I don't know the full magnitude of her investigations, but she assured me that I had the seal of approval from Roger Bullshit uh, in matters of labor relations and unions, and if Roger gave the okay in that respect, it was good enough for her. I don't know what astonished me more, that she had checked up on me, or that Roger gave me a reference. <laughs> That call was the start of what I thought then was a war. But what I know now was really a peacemaking mission. For as acrimonious as things got between faculty and the administration on this campus in those days, has never wanted to defeat anyone. All she wanted was to realize the ideal of Royal Roads as a learning community characterized by equity, and by respect. If it couldn't happen through collegial discussion, there was going to be another route. She would use other tools to get as close as to that ideal as she could. In conversations with her this past August and early September, she told me that she felt as if that ideal were, were, were within reach. Not there yet. I'm sure she's told you that. <laughs> but she thought it was getting closer, much closer than it had been for several years. Although with some regret, she was looking forward to handing over the reins to her successor to deal with the fruits of these efforts and to continue to move rural roads forward in that direction. And moving on to new challenges, as my boss, as the first president of the Confederation of University Faculty Associations of British Columbia, the first president from Rural Roads University, and I'll add, uh, she would have been the first president who was older than age 65 also, but two landmarks would have been broken. That this won't happen is a huge loss to our organization and a personal loss to me. I know Paz, my assistant Angela, who's here today, and I would have made a great team. Uh, I'll admit I had had one small concern. I usually depend on the president of our organization to rein in my wilder and more provocative ideas. <laughs> I think Paz would not only have given me full reign, but she would have been yelling, giddy up, at the top of her lungs. <laughs> but that was Paz. She wanted everyone around her to be the person they were capable of being, even if they didn't know they had it in them. Or perhaps, especially if they didn't know they had it in them. At the beginning of September, my wife Helena, who's with me today, and I came to an arrangement with Paz to take over the lease on her old Vancouver office for my wife's new business. 
In packing up Paz's files and mementos a few weeks before her passing, we came across the artifacts of a life lived purposefully. Maps, travel receipts, uh, brochures from various trade missions, the briefing materials, correspondence, even in just a casual perusal of this material as we were packing it up into the box, told the story of a vigorous and indomitable spirit. We need not mourn for Paz, she has gone to a better place. We may, today, share John, Maria, Jones and their family's loss, as friends and colleagues who also left her. But tomorrow, tomorrow, we'd better be out there, being the people Paz knew we could be, and doing what we can do to make this world just a little bit better. This is the price of Paz's friendship and love. And by the time each of us shuffles off this mortal coil, we better be able to say that we have paid that price in full. John Kivak, I'm here with my wife, uh, Dolores, and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about Paz's National Defense College days. Uh, I was at the National Defense College as the administrator in, in the military as a major at the time, and when she showed up at my office and in her usual tradition said, uh, could we go for coffee? And that led to a, a relationship up until this day of, uh, uh, which I really appreciated, and it's, it's a sad day for me, but also I really appreciated that friendship. She could easily have been a general in the Canadian Forces. <laughs> I, as a young officer, I was told a leader is someone who can get you to do something because you want to do it. Isn't that Paz? <laughs> uh, and she got me to do many things as the administrator of the National College to a point where I was wondering who the combat was. Uh, and we traveled together. And you know that Paz liked to travel. We heard that from the previous uh, speaker. And we did travel uh, to South America, where her Spanish came in handy when we, were in, when we were in South America, to ensure we did not lose everybody's luggage who was on that particular trip. I remember shopping in Rio, Brazil with her and having to get her another suitcase because she couldn't resist all those clothing bargains. <laughs> and somebody may be wearing a scarf from that trip. We both lamented the closure of the National Defense College. And, uh, we, we parted ways, she went off in one direction and I went off in, a, in another direction. And then I ended up getting posted out to uh, Victoria and uh, we came in contact once again with her being in Vancouver. Um, I had known both her and Knut, so I attended uh, Knut's funeral and celebration of life. And uh, it was nice to renew the, uh, the acquaintance. And I was really happy when uh, she fell in love again with uh, John Park. And uh, she was a radiant bride that day, was she not, John? And uh, the spark uh, of life for her was, was terrific. Um, I was even happier when she called and said, I'm coming to Victoria. I'm going to be the director of a new master's program in human security and peace building. And, uh, and I would say, as in the, the president recognizes, that they were very fortunate here to have found someone as dedicated and passionate about both human security and peace building. And I was glad to be of assistance to her early on in the program. She called me up again for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, right? And so we had some teas and had the castle as she sought out new candidates to launch the program and asked for opinions and ideas and uh, uh, she was always so open and so, uh, so generous to everyone. The comments of her learners that I saw on the, the website uh, with the guest book are a testament to her valuable work at Roanoke University. She lived life with class and if she were here physically today she'd be checking up on you and asking about your kids and your career and encouraging us to, uh, to carry on and, and make a difference. So my heartfelt condolences to, uh, to, to the family. Rest in peace, Baz, in the arms of God. A colleague with uh, Paz in, at UBC a number of years ago, and actually she was the general. Um, we had a secret saying for her, and we had a shirt that we were going to give to her. Called, on the back it said, she who must be obeyed. <laughs> we all knew that. So she had the title, and she certainly had our respect to be the general. Um, and she is here today, actually. I can't imagine her missing a party of this size. <laughs> but the thing I want to just say about Paz that I remember most of all is I can't claim any centrality to her life. I'm not as central as perhaps anyone in the front row or the third or seventh or twelfth row. But it didn't seem to matter. It didn't seem to matter how central you thought you were to her life. 
If you ever gained her presence, and her presence couldn't be denied, you were central. You were simply central in smile and embrace. My name is Saul Arbus. Uh, I only came to know Paz uh, in the fall of 2003, when at that time, uh, a small group of us, a very small group of us, proposed the idea of forming a Canadian Federal Department of Peace and Nonviolence as a cabinet level position. Uh, Paz, within moments, spoke to us and told us, I am your greatest supporter. <laughs> and that has buoyed us up all the way through this experience. She has always been there, even in times of great pain. She would come into our basement meeting room with John, and she would sit on very uncomfortable chairs. You know, the $12 variety from Costco. And, uh, but she came, and she participated, and she was the guiding spirit behind our whole movement, which has grown enormously uh, over that time, both nationally and internationally. She said, I am firmly behind this very timely and sensitive proposal. Historically, this is an important time for Canada, when there is a strong need to take a stance in terms of the world we want to live in, the legacy we need to leave for our children, and the enhanced role that Canada needs to play in supporting possibilities for peace in the world. Haas was always imaging peace. She was always concerned about the language that we used in talking about peace. And all of this informed our movement enormously. I worked together with many people, including my wife, Penny Joy, who unfortunately could not be here today, but sends her uh, condolences and sympathies to Paz, who she loved dearly as well. We have come through uh, a time with Pause that is so powerful that we miss her. We, we, there was a great pause in our work. And as recently as this summer, leading up to the third global summit for departments of peace held in Japan, in Japan in September, even as late as August, I believe, she was still intending to come. She was still intending to come with her student, Melanda Schmidt, uh, who is here today, of course, um, and she wanted to present a workshop there, which was by uh, popular demand, because last year uh, at the World Peace Forum, she did a workshop on what could a Department of Peace do? What would it look like? How would it function? Which was so engrossing to people that she would, there was a, a strong demand that she come to Japan and make this presentation. And as all, you all know, this was unfortunately uh, never to be. But this is what was her preface to that all-day workshop that she would have done. Looking at peace movements around the world and recognizing the incredible resilience of the human spirit, I cannot fail to realize that the seeds of love can become, with patience and perseverance, the forces for good and the affirmation of spiritual love and enlightenment. So go in peace, pause. Blessed be the peacemakers, blessed be Paz. And today, I'm wearing the one scarf that was actually still in his wrapper. And, and for me, I thought that was particularly symbolic. Because I opened it up, I put it on, and now I feel that I'm wearing her mantle in the new period of her influence in all of our lives. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elaine Harris. I want to tell you that at least two people here in this audience, women feminists, are wearing high heels. She was here today on behalf of Paz. <laughs> One of them is me. But I want to tell you not to praise and honor her, of course, that too, but to tell you just a little piece of color from a little shared incident that we had together that you'll enjoy. And it was a time when um, I was then uh, living in Newfoundland, doing a fair bit of travel to Ontario, etc. And there was someone in Ottawa who I particularly wanted to meet for something that I particularly wanted to get done. And she was in Ottawa at the time at IDRC as well. And I don't know, there were other meetings. And I tried to set up this particular appointment with this very important, significant person for me, uh, kind of a deputy minister level of things. And I wasn't having any luck. 
And uh, so I thought I had to go home without meeting this person. But in, in the meantime, I called Paz just to say hello. And it was at her office. And I said, I'm not going to keep you. Just want to say hello. I'm here. Hope to see so and so, but it hasn't happened. So just let me know and see you next time, etc. And she said, Well, well, you don't need to see so and so. You know what we're doing is much more interesting than you know what he's doing. So I want you to come down and you know talk to me. I need to tell you what we're doing. <laughs> so um, I thought, okay, we'll go down and see what Paz is doing. It was always interesting, but off I went. So I went in, and uh, for a couple of minutes, she talked to me about something or other that was going on in IDRC, and I thought, well, I thought, no, this is not that really fascinating to me. Like, well, what's, you know, what's happening? So it was only within five minutes, and then she said, now, the next piece, I have to show, take you down the hall. So off we went, you know, like, on me, behind, pads, going down the hall and through various locked doors and security and all those things that <laughs> she could somehow get past. We swept into a whole suite of offices somewhere, and by this time, I realized, you know, it was possible that we were going outside her territory and into another. On the door, I saw it was the name of the person who I wanted to see. <laughs> so we went into that person's office, uh, where it's Dr. Sensa. Well, I'm sorry, he's had a meeting down the hall with a number of important visitors, the secretary. She said, oh, very good, thank you. And so off we went down the hall. <laughs> Knocked on the door, she steps out, we need to see you, uh, Dr. So and so. So, you know, in the middle of this meeting, she pulled him out. She said, Now, you know, it's very important that you meet Elaine Harris. So, she did an introduction. She said, Why we needed to meet. She said, Now, I have a cab downstairs. You two know, you two need to go and have a coffee. <laughs> and he said, Pez, I'm in the middle of a meeting. And she said, That's okay, I'll take over your meeting. <laughs> and she did. In order to pass to say thank you very much for everything because I learned so much from you from her. So.
gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado la marcha de mis pies cansados, con ellos anduve ciudades y charcos, playas y desiertos, montañas y llanos. casa tuya, tu calle y tu patio. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado Me dio el corazón que aquí tras su marco cuando miro el fruto del cerebro humano cuando miro el bueno tan lejos del malo cuando miro el fondo
has been addressed in the last few minutes. Okay, isn't this program go forward? It has not been easy. Uh, but that the program go forward, attract people from around the world. But above all, that the learners, a number of whom I see here in the room, achieve what they're capable of achieving. That's really what she wanted. Make the kind of contribution that they can make uh, in the world. So, yes, pa Paz has left us a legacy. Uh, to my surprise, uh, she's actually given me a scarf. <laughs> but with Paz, there's always a little twist in it because she has something in mind for us to give back to her. And that's something to give back to her is we've got to keep at it. Learners, faculty, administration, friends. I can't believe that any of us in this room will leave here without the nagging feeling that she had an agenda for us and that she's up there watching to see if we're performing and we're up to scratch. It was a privilege to know her. We are all across the world from uh, Congo to Brussels to New Zealand. As for all of us who couldn't be here today, I'm here to uh, bring our love and greetings and, uh, and heartfelt um, wishes to my family and my friends gathered here today. Um, I remember very clearly our first day as a cohort gathered not so very far from here when Paz swept into the room. I don't think she ever actually walked into the room. She always <laughs> swept into the room. And uh, with such beauty and grace and uh, a glow of love and warmth and mischief about her. <laughs> um, I think I echo probably the sen sentiments of many of her learners in that, uh, although many of them have had the privilege of knowing her much longer than I did, that within the very short time that I got to know her, um, and I got echoing the thread that was touched on earlier, that she made each of us feel so incredibly special. And uh, I guess I would sum up that secret that she knew as that she understood that love only multiplies, it doesn't divide. Uh, there's always more of it, and each person is made more special and more unique by the love that she would shower on them. Um, she also had a really special knack of uh, giving people missions to undertake and making them think that they were the ones who had thought of them. Um, I entered the cohort uh, with a sense of being an imposter because I had only a hotel background to my name. And uh, in her one-on-one -on -one interview with me, which she did with each one of her learners lovingly and painstakingly, I expressed that fear to her. And she said, do you think I picked you by accident? <laughs> I said, well, I guess not. <laughs> she said, don't worry, I have things for you to do, and you'll find out what they are. And uh, I very quickly did find out what those, what those were. Um, Blueprint for Peace um, is something that I heard her speak about at length during uh, a rotary lunch that I had the privilege of assisting her with. And she described it as the crown jewel of this program. Um, I'm sure many of you know what it is. It was founded by learning from our program, by her learners, and by her in partnership with uh, the University of Makerere, probably pronouncing that wrong, in Uganda, and works with residents of IDP camps in northern Uganda. And uh, she winked at me one day in class, and she said, I have an announcement that you're going to want to listen up for. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and she said, um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we're all going to be going to Uganda next year. And, uh, I think we need to uh, start our fundraising events for Blueprint because every cohort has to do that. And she looked straight at me and I thought, oh, here comes hotels. They actually are in service of peace building after all. <laughs> and um, the labor of love for our cohort this year has been the organization of, uh, of the gala show piece that takes place on November 9th in support of Blueprint. And at every step of the way, when I announced things on behalf of the class to, to Paz, would show her the graphic design and the brand that we come up with and the location, which is the very glamorous Western Bear Mountain. Every time the word glamorous would come up, she would just have this sparkle. <laughs> and my very last visit with her, I had the great privilege of showing her our poster, um, which is truly beautiful and um, not nearly as beautiful as Cass herself. But uh, she looked at the, po the poster and her eyes just glowed. And she said, I'm so looking forward to being there. And I'm so looking forward to having her. I'm 
my name is Harry Burbringer. I'm one of the support staff here in the library of Rhodes. And uh, as with Gordon Smith and others before me, I, I don't know that I can say much more other than what others have already said, but I felt it was important to, to add my small testimony to things. Um, and I was going to speak extemporaneously and realize that if I did that, I'd end up sitting down and realizing I needed to say a few things that I felt I could say. So I'll try to. Um, I only uh, met Kaz. I, I was I was not a, a close friend of hers, uh, and I I certainly wish that I had emailed her more frequently, spoken with her more frequently, and made the opportunity to speak with her, uh, to visit with her more frequently. But I only met Paz as recently as, as uh, 2003. It was at the start of 2003 I began working here as a support staff person in the library. Um, that uh, same year, uh, if I remember correctly, the uh, School of Peace and Conflict Management launched its master's program in human security and peace building, uh, which uh, Paz basically created. Um, my wife and I had returned in spring 2001 after uh, living for uh, nearly three years in Jerusalem, and uh, my overriding concern then and now uh, has been the work for justice and, and self-determination for Palestinians, and indeed uh, a sustainable, viable, just peace for Israeli Jews and Palestinians. And as an employee here, I've always been most interested in the programs of, of the School of Peace and Conflict Management, and uh, I made a point of, of uh, getting together with Paz at one point and uh, spoke with her at length. She was, of course, extremely encouraging. I spoke with her about the program and I spoke with her about my background, my interests, and priorities. And, and following that, Paz always uh, invited me to special events and uh, and even to uh, take place in on-site, take part in on-site classes of the Human Security Peace Building Program. So I was able to sit in some of those. Um, Paz was a, a tremendous, uh, persistent force, as, as many people have said. She was, she was endlessly imaginative. She was always positive. She was always encouraging. She was terrifically energetic, and her mind was always at work. And I would often see Paz and on campus uh, with her uh, partner in crime, her, her sort of enabler, Beth Hill, who was her program associate in the program. Uh, Paz would uh, come up with the full-blown ideas, and, and then Bev, to her tremendous credit, would help make them practical. Um, I've, uh, I've felt Paz's uh, presence uh, quite strongly many times since she passed on on October 8th. So uh, I don't doubt that she's still uh, motivating and inspiring us and others. And there may be some people who are skeptical about such things, but I'm glad to hear that there are a number of other people in this room who, who also who feel that. So yes, I pass this here today too. Thanks, Mark. I when I met her. Um, she did have a habit of collecting people and I was happy to be one of them. She was a fiercely passionate woman and she was so solid in her identity and her conviction of what she was supposed to do in this life. So over this past summer when I was riding my bike home on the Goose, I was fortunate to be able to stop at uh, Paz and John's house often and um, sometimes share a meal and uh, or a pretty bad movie, <laughs> or a cup of tea. And uh, Paz's hospitality, combined with John's gracious hosting, made the occasions really warm and memorable. And we began almost a daily ritual of foot massages, and uh, with special aromatic creams. And uh, she loved this, and I kind of suspected it alleviated the pain that she seldom spoke about. Um, our conversations were relaxed and warm and funny and touching and we meandered all over the place at many diverse subjects and stories. And I believe that at a cellular level she started to let go, to be a bit more at peace with herself. Such erotic relationships are, are occasions of growth and as unpredictable as growth itself. Yet nothing important happens without them. The sparks that leap back and forth between teacher and students, connecting them in a relationship that has little to do with socialization, but much to do with self-creation, are the principal means by which the institutions of a liberal society get changed. I believe that good teachers must have a love affair with learning and be in love with life itself. That good teachers must already know who they are, possess a capacity for connectedness, and have the courage to take risks, play deeply, have humor and heart to plunge in, to be at once teacher and student, 
while inviting the student to be a teacher of themselves and others if education is to take place. And the final virtue is to have the ability to love the students in spite of everything else. In the words of her colleague and mentor and my hero, Paolo Freire, in Pedagogy of the Heart, he says it must be a very affirmative love, a love which accepts, a love for students, which pushes us to go beyond, which makes us more and more responsible for our task. From a phenomenological perspective, we inherently know when one's heart is open and when they're into their work, when we're witnessing their truth. Their words have a certain familiar ring to them. When this occurs, subject, teacher, student, knit together in a community of learning and living, of being and knowing in the world. There, the learning aperture is opened, gathered information alchemically transformed through the lens of experience and developed into meaning, assimilated into real life and application. I have this snapshot etched in my mind, this phenomenal photo of Paz falling into a greater love with her cohorts, teaching as a political, artistic, and loving act. And if we're heeding and answering our deepest calling, offering our own words, delivering them in our own voice, or voce, the etymological root of vocation, this is where we best serve. Frederick Buchner said, where our deepest gladness meets the world's hunger. I remember Paz's service was even in her bearing. Gliding or sweeping through the hallways, skirts, scarves, beads, swishing. You know, she did bring glamour to the institution. That straight, strong back of the warrior. And she had that soft, relational, open heart of lover of the world. I want to remember to embody that fine balance in my own posture in my work at the university. And further, I'll act as an encourager of others. She encouraged me to bring my own brand of teaching, my arts-based inquiry into her programs, and I want to be able to encourage others, students, colleagues, friends, family, just to keep, to keep has enlivened in me is to encourage others. She viewed barriers uh, as steps, not stops. For Paz, so often forging the key to opening the door to getting somewhere else, getting something more accomplished was indeed part holy terror, part holy angel in her quest for possibility. Uh, one thing I did want to mention that's not on that little program uh, that we handed out is that Paz's extensive library, thanks to Maria and John's gift, uh, is being divided up three ways. Macarera University will receive the lion's share of our human security and peace building inventory, while the residual will stay in our own library on a special name-plated shelf dedicated to her contributions to human security and peace building through education. The adult education portion of her books will fittingly find their way back to UBC. And lastly, any duplicate textbooks will find their way to those students with the greatest financial need. Thomas Perry, one of the granddaddies of the environmental eco-psychology movement, once wrote that perhaps the universe fashioned Walt Whitman in order to feel more of its own grandeur. Well, I wonder if the universe conspired to create Paz Budadol in order to feel more of its own love. <laughs> I certainly felt that. And another Thomas, a favorite Thomas of Paz, is Thomas Merton, said, there is in all visible things a hidden wholeness. I noticed as the days passed, despite the disease prevailing and starting to consume, the dross of the everyday stresses fell away, and Paz did seem more relaxed, sometimes strangely joyful and more whole. Absolutely certain of our collective need to really love each other no matter what, and she became more and more calm in her knowing. My last visit was with Paz was a precious final hour at hospice on Thanksgiving Day, just before she died, reading to her the scores of love letters and well-wishing emails that poured in from around the world. Thanks to the good instincts of Bev Hill, who broadcast my home email across the world, this came from students both past and present in Uganda, Rwanda, Swaziland, Lebanon, Indonesia, Canada, and Europe. Although she'd been in a deep, morphine-induced slumber for most of the day at that point, I knew she heard every word. I knew she was beaming inside. <clears throat> That's hard to say. But so, thank you, Paz. You did make a world of difference. You made a great effort in this world. I'm uplifted by your thoughts of gathering peacefully together, listening deeply and patiently to one another, and to really, really love each other. Many more coming from the Latin American community in Vancouver and other places. Royal Roads will have a scholarship in Paz's name to which you are invited to donate as much as you possibly can. 
Now, I don't know who is actually in charge of collecting the money, but I'd say that Hillary Layton would probably be pretty good at that. So if you, I, I strongly exhort you to dig into your pockets here today before you leave or get on a ferry and give something to this fund at Royal Roads. In addition, the University of British Columbia is endowing an annual le memorial lecture in Paz's name. Could the UBC professors stand up, please? People who are in this room right now, friends of Paz, people like Guy Toussaint and distinguished Canadians who, will, who are in the area and can basically be brought in without a fee. But later, we will have to fly in distinguished people from Chile and other places, and they have to be housed and accommodated. So we plan to perpetuate the name of both Canute and Paz Mutadol in this annual lecture. I strongly urge you to give something to both. That's what I'm going to do today. Actually, I've already given to the UBC end. There's no choice on that. <laughs> but I will be giving a pretty good donation to Royal Roads, and I encourage you to do the same. Okay, our next assembly. You know, at first I only met her as a neighbor. She lived across the street from me. And I didn't know all about what she did or where she was, but little by little I found out. A, well, first of all, after my husband died, Paz invited me to go out to dinner with her and John. And they were just so friendly and so loving. And on various occasions, I'm sure you all understand, she was most thoughtful. Well, then, in 2005, we, um, or 2006, we were on the Strata Council together. And that was an adventure. <laughs> I began to learn about quite a bit about Paz, little by little. And she invited me to several affairs here at Royal Roads. And I, I think about her so often I, I'd, um, as I go by. Well, after she was had the surgery, I visited her. And she would look out the door. And from her windows, she could see the front of my garage. Now, understandably, you can know that I use a three-wheeled bicycle when I ride on the goose. And I would go out of my garage and I'd find out that Paz would watch. And so I would wave to her. Now, I couldn't see her, but I knew she was there and I was hoping she would see that I was thinking about her. And very often I prayed for her. And not long before she, oh, let's see, maybe a month ago, one night, she, one day she said, can I come over and see you? She came over and we had a nice visit. And she didn't want to talk about herself. She wanted to ask me questions about what I was doing. Isn't that pass? She's a wonderful lady. And I'm privileged to, to know John and meet some of her, her family as well. It was a privilege to know her. And I wanted to bring out the fact that as a person, not just as a professor and all the things that she did, she was a very loving friend. And I, I loved her. I miss her. I see that. That garage, and I realize, and I see her house over there, and I realize, oh, she's no longer physically there. God bless you. My name is Rick Kula. I have the honor of teaching here at Royal Roads, and I'm the acting president of the Royal Roads University Faculty Association, uh, acting in Paz's stead. Um, Paz and I met shortly after I arrived here, also in early 2003, but we, we became friends in a time of darkness and strife here, a time of conflict between the university and the faculty. Uh, we became a team um, negotiating a first collective agreement here, unionizing the faculty. It was not a dream I think that either of us ever had to wake up one morning as the president of the vice president of the newest trade union of British Columbia, but it was it was something we did together out of respect, respect for the university, respect for ourselves. Uh, I learned very quickly that Paz had a very strong sense of purpose. She brought that sense of purpose to everything she did. And from what I'm hearing today, she brought that purpose uh, through her whole life. She was a fighter, clearly, uh, but a, a fighter for justice, uh, a fighter for right. Um, she wasn't, while well, she was a fighter, she wasn't a scrapper. I think she always maintained the dignity and intelligence, even as she was never willing to, I think, from what I saw, to, to move away from a fight. She fought with me. We didn't always agree in, as we were negotiating, and sometimes she even acquiesced. <laughs> Major points for me. 
I'd just like to say that, you know, on behalf of the faculty and to John, and of course and to John and Maria that, and to Lisa, that, that you know, we love Paz, and, and we do love Paz. And she brought tremendous uh, gifts to all of us, to the post-secondary education system in British Columbia and to Canada. And just a few little things. She, she really was a, a fighter. She fought to the end. About a month ago, and Rob Cliff, I think it was here from KUFA, um, we had the last meeting of the Confederation of University Faculty Associations that Paz was able to attend. She really wanted to go. We traveled on the float plane together with her high heels on. Going in, those of you who know about float planes, walking up the little door that turns into a ladder. She's deeply jaundiced, she's dozy with morphine, but she wanted to be there. And we traveled over, over to, uh, with the high heels, over to Vancouver. And finally, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, we all, or many of us spent time with Paz in, in hospice. And it was brilliant that her children convinced her that it was the right thing to do when they did. So Tuesday night, she came in on Monday, Tuesday night I was there, and, uh, you know, doing different things. And uh, a young medical student came in, a UBC medical student came in and, and said, you know, Paz, how are you? Great, Paz says. <laughs> this is in hospice. And then and this medical student introduced herself, a fourth year student from UBC. And after a minute or two, Paz said, said to her, do you know Michelle Toussignon? Um, and this woman did. They had been together up in Prince George at the medical, interior medical um, program and now here on the island medical program at, at UVic. Well, Paz says, Michelle's father is General Guy Toussignon. And then Paz says, I collect generals. <laughs> I quickly piped up and said, and admirals too. <laughs> and Paz says, and commanding officers. <laughs> and this young medical student looking at this ill, dying woman is trying to figure out, I'm sure, like how does she mean that? Like in a biblical sense? She was like, <laughs> like playing cards? Or, or how do you collect generals? <laughs> you know, shortly before that, uh, when Paz was really not able to, to, to take uh, the kind of responsibility and care she wanted to take with her learners. And her learners were, you know, they, 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 gave, her, they gave her such life. She asked if I would um, take over the, her, her class, the class. She was teaching online right up to the very end. And I thought, you know, maybe my last gift to Paz, and we had done a lot of intense work through the labor relations here, maybe I thought my last gift to her would be to take that burden off her shoulders to say, sure, I, I'm happy to take your class. And I didn't ask anyone at the university if that was okay to do. I just, this was just my gift to her. But you know, Paz, as we've heard today, was a giver of gifts. And it took just a short while before I realized, no, no, this wasn't my gift to her. This was her last gift to me. Because Paz's students are incredible. And as much as I love my own students in my master's program, I'm totally ready to move in with, with uh, <laughs> Melanda and Jody and this whole band of people because they are wonderful. They are wonderful, wonderful people. And it is a gift to me. And I guess that's Paz's real gift, is this gift to the world of these wonderful, wonderful people that she's had influence over. And, and through them, the influence will go further. Thank you. We're also working with PAS and uh, Departments of Peace and Departments and Ministries of Peace Movement, which is a really exciting thing, and her enthusiasm there was wonderful. Um, I, I actually chose to speak because I, I have a little bit of a different relationship with PAS that I would like to speak to, and that's that I have arthritis very badly, and pain is a part of my life all the time. And when Paz first got diagnosed and during the year that she was sick, um, there was sometimes that she did talk about pain. And she talked about pain in a way that made it okay to be in my body. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but because she made peace with herself, it, it helped all of us make peace with uh, ourselves. And so that was a big part of it. And the other part was when I, when I found out that she had died, I started to think about what part of Paz that I would miss the most, you know, address that one. And I thought the part of Paz that I would miss the most is the part of her that believed in peace. I mean, she didn't just believe it, she saw it. She saw that we as a global community could get along if we could be educated to do such. And really, I think what she thought was between us and peace was education in it. And so I thought that there was this kind of emptiness inside of me 
because her belief is not so physically present anymore. And so I'm nervous to get up and speak, but I'm doing it because I'm asking everyone here if we can, as, as an honor, and I'm asking you very humbly, also vision peace as clearly as she did so that we think peace and we speak peace and we are peace and that we go forth and we help other people see that this is possible because I think that the greatest legacy that we could all walk out and get to pass is that we become a peaceful global community. Thank you. I'm the uh, retired uh, acting president of Rose University. Uh, I retired uh, after I moved um, I met Paz um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was, I sort of came after the acrimony that uh, Robert, uh, Robert Cliff referred to earlier with his Beckham administration. And uh, our, our task was to put things right. And I remember the first meeting that I had with Paz and, and the faculty executive after the meeting, I, I said to one of my, my colleagues, who was that woman? <laughs> <laughs> because um, she was she came on with uh, a lot of strength and a lot of conviction and a lot of uh, good things to say about, about the university, about the faculty, and about what had happened previously. Um, I fell in love with Paz over the last year. Um, we had an, an incredible number of meetings, uh, not just with the executive, but individually. Um, earlier when she was more healthy, and laterally when she was um, we visited her in the hospital and at her home and so on. And somebody else mentioned earlier, um, she was working all the time. Mm -hmm. We visited her home, there'd be a computer there, and the cell phone and the phone, and the same thing in the hospital. And uh, the meeting in the hospital was interrupted by phone calls, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's very true what everybody's saying. But you know, Paz um, was so positive and, and so precise in what she wanted to achieve and so good spirited. You know, I think over the, over the year that her and I probably set the record for hugs. <laughs> we hugged all the time and we got to know each other extremely well and I thank her for that and wish you rest in peace. Thank you. My name is Alicia Kermack. I, I am Paz's daughter. Um, and I think back to um, 
1998 when Maria and I announced we were to get married. Um, Paz was overjoyed by this. Now, whether this had anything to do with Maria's choice of a husband to be, I don't know. But um, she, she, she saw it as a great example, great opportunity for a hell of a party. Now, <laughs> we, we wanted uh, something fairly small and quiet, 25 or 30 guests, something like that. And Paz, of course, wanted to invite dozens of people and I don't know how many musicians and I don't know how many courses to dinner. And um, it fell to me to, um, to play bad cop while Maria sat smiling enigmatically. <laughs> and I, uh, I had to say gently as possible, no, Paz, no, that's not what we had in mind, no. Thank you very much, Paz, no. And after half an hour or so of this, she threw up her hands, and if she had any papers, or to her phone was up as well, and said, all right, I, I'll say nothing, I'll do nothing. I'll just sit there quietly, and you guys can run with it. And uh, again, if the you know, occasion had allowed for it, I'm sure she would have stormed out of the room at that point. Um, eventually, of course, uh, she changed her mind, and, and uh, the wedding went ahead very, very happily. I had about 45 or so guests. And for some years afterwards, I told the story very proudly, as though I had actually got my way with Paz. <laughs> Until last year, when she was in union negotiations here at Wild Rose. And it finally, finally dawned on me to wonder, had that been what she wanted all along? Have I been, <laughs> <laughs> Have I been so inclined, I would have tipped off the management here at Wild Rose. But, uh, <laughs> And I never did uh, summon up the courage to ask the question. I, I was afraid of the answer. <laughs> uh, so I, if there's a, a heaven and, and I should make it, I'm sure they're going to have jelly and wine there. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll split a bottle. I'm sure she'll insist on mine. And I'll, and I'll talk about it with her, but I know what she's going to say. Thank you. My name is Gene Lake, and I knew Paz through the uh, for the peace building program here at Royal Roads. Like, like a lot of the people, certainly a lot of the men in this room, I love Paz. But what I really loved was to watch Paz love people. Paz added warmth and love to our lives. She, around, she surrounded us with the beauty of her caring. She shared what we see, what we feel, what we love. She helped us with her problems. She listened. And as she listened, we began to hear the language of our own hearts. With her, we could walk along the remembered paths of our lives and completely share our experiences. With her, we could work the soil of forgotten dreams that needed to be tended, nurtured once again. And with her, we could plant new seeds of new dreams. Returning to Paz was like going back to a special place and finding the same warm feeling that was unchanged by time or distance. With Paz you could share the precious times, the memorable moments of being a child, a teenager, an adult, a parent, and a grandparent. With Paz, you could share growing up, growing down, and growing old. You always had a place to go to be accepted and understood, a place where you could laugh and cry, a place where your thoughts were heard, your feelings understood, and your emotions accepted. She held you in her heart, and she placed you ever so gently exactly where you needed to be placed. <clears throat> she made our lives fuller, richer, more open, more beautiful, and more blessed. When she slipped the bonds of this earth, she rode away smiling on the wings of a cohort of angels, knowing that she was going to a better <coughs> place where one day she would see us all again. <laughs> And I just wanted to talk about something that, that hasn't been mentioned 
yet about Haas, and that is her Chileanness, which is what we share. <laughs> And uh, even though I didn't see past very frequently, sometimes, uh, you know, if I did a workshop for her uh, through my theater work, um, but when, whenever we met, it was instant recognition, and, uh, and it felt that I had known her all my life. And um, I think that even though Paz was such an international woman moving all over the world, she had very, very strong roots in the country of her birth. And maybe that's what gave her that strength, that wonderful strength that she had. And, and one of, amongst the many wonderful visits we had, one that I really cherish, it was very special, was when she invited me to celebrate a very Chilean ritual, which is the five o'clock tea. For some reason, it's, that is absolutely Chilean. Um, and she had invited a group of students. She had organized a group of, uh, not students, but they were primary school teachers from Chile that came here. I don't know how long they were here for a couple of weeks or something like that, but those, uh, many of, of them were, were teachers from small schools in, in the countryside in Chile, and, and Paz brought them here, and, and they seemed to have had a wonderful time, and uh, this this Chilean tea that we had and John was there too. And, and it was so like home. It was wonderful. <laughs> I, I thank Pat very much for that experience. Uh, I'm Sister Loretta. Many of you met. She was just here recently. And Loretta was um, she was very um, helpful in uh, I was going, maybe some of you know, Mom built a house in Chile for the last year. So among many other accomplishments. Uh, this past year, with her illness, she uh, helped unionize the school, welcomed the cohorts, built a house uh, world away, and uh, really kept a positive spirit the whole time. Uh, she didn't let us really on her suffering, and uh, was pretty brave right to the very end. So Loretta writes, uh, I mentioned Loretto because she's writing this from her house is actually right next to Mom's house, so she was very uh, uh, she was able to manage the building that to pass. <clears throat> I'm seated in the living room of her Chilean house, writing these words for her, my darling sister, as I used to call her. She didn't like me talking too much. Quote, say the editing, <laughs> say the editing comments straight to the point, please. <laughs> um, so this will be a short one from Loretto. Uh, she was born knowing exactly what she had to do to earn her life and justify her transit on this world. And this meant to give and commit herself to all human beings by way of love, help, support, and teaching. How to be, how to be a better person. Her generosity was beyond limits. Past first rule was love, love, and love. No matter how, no matter who, no matter what. And she, great, she greatly honored her own rule. At first she became a nun after graduating, but soon she realized that she could serve and help people better from the outside. So she quit the convent, and in order to achieve her years, sorry, in order to achieve her goals, she started working the hardest I've ever seen for a 19-year-old lady. You could say most of the accomplishments that some of you spoke about were done before she had reached her 20s. Um, she was, uh, uh, she was an old, uh, thank you, so the young lady full of dreams and hopes and ambitions. She clearly knew that the more she studied and learned, the better equipped she will be to give herself to others. She had the rare art of bringing out the best of people. She made them feel unique. She was warm, joyful, and generous. She loved life in all its forms and enjoyed the beauty of everything. She loved dancing. She was also uh, glamorous and coquettish. <laughs> oh my god, how she loved clothes and jewelry. <laughs> Scarves. Um, she was so happy shopping for a fur coat and for her favorite pearls that rainy day at the beginning of September when we went offshore to Skagway, Alaska. She went on a cruise in her last month. Even though she only knew too well that she would be going a month later. She was always dining out. She knew all the best places in town. If she hadn't been an academic, she could have uh, succeeded as a gourmet tourist guy. <laughs> 
As I said, she loved people and she loved sharing a good meal. She enjoyed that too. She knew the power of words, how to say the right thing at the right moment. She was a warrior, but a happy and cheerful one. I rarely remember seeing her depressed or down. She was on motion all the time, relentless, sleepless, pursuing endlessly her goals. One at a time, she used to plan them well in advance. She achieved all her goals. She was happy, successful, and beautiful. She made friends all around the world just by living by the simplest of rules. <coughs> Love and always give others the best of you. No matter what, no matter how, no matter who, give the best of you, always. Only in doing so, you will help to build a better world. Darling sister, rest in peace, you made it. You earned your life as very few people do. You chose how to live, you chose how to die, and you succeeded both. Your memory and lessons will be forever in our hearts. Thanks, my dear. Thank you so much. That's from Loretto. Um, personal note on behalf of the family, um, um, I want to thank all of our friends and students and colleagues that have, uh, uh, well, I have to say we remember you from, we were little kids, it's so nice to see some faces that I remember from as a child at ski trips. Um, my mom had a way of bringing in and uh, collecting a very nice group of friends. Uh, so throughout the years, and then especially over the last year, especially over the last couple months, I was able to see just how many people she'd influenced, but in turn how nice and generous and kind you all have you all been to mom and our family. Um, you know, it's amazing what I've seen people on her deathbed reading her love letters. Some of these people have known her less than a year. And these are letters that you would think would come from people that have known her a lifetime. So I want to say thank you. You're all very decent people. And uh, thank you for making such a good effort. And on uh, behalf of uh, the family, I want to thank you and for helping home through. Um, I can tell you, I don't really think she, she suffered. Like, she was happy. She had a good year at the end, and um, she was really at peace even when we brought her to the hospice. Um, you know, at first she was a little resistant. She thought we tricked her into going there. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, we've gone, you know, see a doctor and her oncologist, and he said maybe we should go in, and we convinced her. And but within 15 minutes of being there, she was thankful always being positive and thankful that she knew she was in the right place. People at the hospice were great. Um, people at the university have been great. Thank you for helping us put this on. And um, all of our friends, you know who you are, I don't want to list you. It's, it's everyone. And the letters that have come and poured in from all around the world, we sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Francisco Juarez and I'm a justice uh, student. Um, one of the programs that was a, a feeder for uh, PATH's uh, program in human security and peace building. Many of the students that I, uh, that I studied with went on to, uh, to study with her. Um, I uh, bring uh, also my condolences uh, from my family uh, and uh, uh, my stepfather, uh, Fernando Portales, who was uh, involved at the early stages of uh, designing and talking to Path about uh, designing her home in Chile. Uh, Path was very well known, uh, was a very well known and, and cherished member of the Chilean community in Canada. Uh, and passing on the lessons um, that uh, many Chileans, about peace, that many Chileans learned the hard way. Uh, I lived in Chile for a time and uh, felt drawn to her and her program because of this uh, and because of that understanding of, uh, of peace. Um, every conversation with Path was a, was a marker, uh, was a defining moment in uh, one's education and certainly I felt that way on a continuing basis every time I, I spoke with her. Um, I felt that she was a light uh, to guide um, um, 
uh, f many in the fight for uh, the ideals of human security and uh, to bring attention to the uh, dangers of unfettered militarism. And her teachings and words were central in my leaving the Canadian forces in opposition to our country's new militarism. I just wanted to say uh, gracias para tu luz, paz, ole tu vida revolucionaria y hasta la victoria siempre. All right, can you hear yeah. well? Yeah, no yeah. problems. All right, my name is Michael Kreeft. I'm a member of the Master's Human, of Human and Security and Peacebuilding Program uh, Cohort two, 2006. And I wanted to present this little journal here. Um, our cohorts, and, and actually we included all the cohorts in it, we decided to collect our thoughts um, in terms of our her impact on our lives and write them down here. So. Um, myself and Fritzi Czerny, here the only two remaining people from my cohort in this in Victoria, received a whole pile of emails and messages and whatnot, and then wrote them out in this book for you. So uh, I'd like to read just the introduction we wrote for it to kind of summarize what it is. So. This book is a learning journal, as Paz would have called it, of some of her students from the MAHSP program reflecting on her impact on their lives. Representing the effects she had on her students, it is a living example of everything she strove for as an educator. For each entry here, mountains more share the, share the sentiment. It is a testament to her vast reach, as wide as her ambition, determination, and love combined. It is a small representation of the good she passed on into the world, and for that, her students and the lives touched through, through them can be grateful for a life well lived. So that's just a quick summary of, of what this is. It's by no means complete yet, just uh, largely because her students are scattered so far over the globe and many of them are not able to get to a computer very quickly. So I encourage you to, uh, to uh, any other comments or, or mementos that sort of are along these lines to include on the, the pages that are still empty in there. And I hope it's just a, a small gesture that uh, means something to, to you and, and, and so that you know um, you know, Paz, Paz, Paz was an educator, at least to us, that was her primary role, and she, she really, uh, I think the words in this attest that, that she was, for many people, the most important educator they ever uh, encountered in their life. So, thank you very much, Paz. Okay, so and I, I, I'd also need to include uh, my contact information in case y you want to, uh, I don't know, get in touch with me about this. My name is Michael Kreeft. My email is k-r-e-e-f-t-m at juno.com. That's j-u-j-u-n-o.com. Uh, and my phone number here in Victoria is 294-5916. So, and I'll pass along any further messages I get um, to, I suppose, Bev uh, Hill. Uh, she's my main contact here at the university. So, thank you very much. My name is Scott Clements. I'm uh, a graduate of the Royal Roads Military College, I'm also an honorary graduate uh, of Royal Roads University, and I currently hold the position of the vice chair of the Royal Roads Uni University Foundation. Uh, I'm also one of Paz's collected generals. In fact, uh, Paz and I first met uh, when I was the commandant of the uh, National Defense College. And uh, I as was the uh, uh, pattern at the time and, and the right thing to do, uh, each of the 45 uh, course members uh, in the very uh, first day, uh, first week, pardon me, of the uh, course was interviewed by the Commandant. Uh, an important interview for the uh, course member and, and of course for the Commandant uh, because the nature of uh, success of the uh, year spent at National Defense College was largely due to the fact that we attempted to bring together uh, tremendous people that would learn from each other. So in swishes Paz Budadal into the Commandant's office, sits down, she turns on her transmit button and talks for 30 minutes without taking a breath. After which I just looked at her, smiled and said, fabulous. You're going to fit in beautifully here. Interview's over. And indeed, she did fit in, absolutely. Um, she spent a lot of time with the uh, Commandant, me, over the year, and progressively um, made many, many positive suggestions for improvement to uh, National Defense College routine, uh, to the effect that by the end of the year, 
uh, she had convinced me that she ought to stay around at uh, National Defense College and become um, a part of the faculty, which happened. And when General Guy Toussignan took over from me, um, he had uh, a stalwart uh, to help him uh, uh, improve and make sure that uh, National Defense College became important than to the uh, Department of Defense. Um, that's the serious side of Paz. Uh, we all know just how strong a leader she was and how effective she was, but she also had that fun side that uh, we heard about today. And indeed, on the 128 days of travel throughout the world that the National Defense College uh, participated in, um, we got to see an awful lot of the fun side of Paz Budadol. Uh, my wife uh, got to travel uh, as the Commandant's wife on all the trips, and the two of them, I, I mean, I thought I had uh, the worst shopaholic in the world. And I found out that uh, she was quite outdone by Paz Budadol, and together they were dangerous. Um, the uh, credit debt that I amassed in that year uh, it took two years for me to pay off. In fact, she used to buy lunches and breakfasts and dinners. I guess um, uh, in order to uh, get access to the Commandant, I mean I always offered, she always paid. So finally I said, look, I'm going to buy next time. You pick the place, I'll pay. Well, we were in Hong Kong and she knows uh, uh, all of the fine restaurants in the world. Well, she took me to a place called the Peninsula. And as we uh, motored over in the boat, got off, walked up to this place, I noticed at least 35 Bentleys and Rolls Royces, and I thought, this is really going to be bad, and it was. <laughs> but we had a great evening, and it was, a, it was something that uh, she and I uh, joked about often uh, uh, as we met again. Anyway, Paz, uh, we all love you. The tribute today was absolutely appropriate, and um, we will carry on. Thank you very much. And I've been a friend and colleague of Paz's for about 30 years. And I worked with Paz in the, in the peace movements during the wars in Central America. And then uh, most recently I've been supporting her out here at Royal Roads um, where I'm adjunct faculty. And I guess the most important thing I want to say about her is that I hope that her students understand that the passion and the love and the concern that she um, showed to them is what was really at the heart of her as an educator and I hope they really listen and understand that they have been given the gift of love and they're to carry that throughout the world and work for peace wherever they are and that is the most powerful thing they could do in Paz's legacy. Gracias compa. Adelante. My name is Marion Cumming from Victoria and I was so thrilled to meet Paz through her husband John Park as they ascended the steps into church a few years ago and ascending is the the right term it was so like both of them and the, I wrote John a note that in connection with Paz's passing and I spoke of how I love her name Paz which of course means peace and also that I kept thinking of Paloma de Paz from my days in Mexico, the dove of peace and somehow I found myself picturing her flying peacefully over the horizon and I love the thought that life is eternal and love is immortal and the horizon is only the limit of our view and having just attended that beautiful memorial service, I have a sense of Paz coming right back over that horizon again in such a beautiful legacy. And I chose this scarf, that one of her beautiful scarves that reminds me so of peace. It's the color of peace and not of surrender. Thank you, Paz. My name is Leo Young. I met Paz uh, for the first time at a Department of Peace meeting and uh, was fortunate enough to be a delegate to the uh, second global summit for the creation of departments of peace which was here at Royal Rose and she uh, managed and hosted the, uh, the global summit and it was wonderful to be able to work with her at the time. Mm. 
I had the privilege of going to her last public event, which was a talk at Camosun College on September 20th, and uh, she gave this really great talk. It was obvious to anyone who knew her that she was uh, in a lot of pain, but she just kept on going and gave from her heart and gave a really great talk. Uh, after, afterwards, she took uh, a few of us out for supper, and I had a chance to sit around a table with her and enjoy picking duck, um, which was a wonderful experience. And uh, even at that moment, her mind was busy, and she was looking for ways to create peace in the world and was open to uh, any sort of ideas.